And as I begin the sermon, I want to invite you, would you please join uh, your heart and your mind with me in prayer. We pray. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Uh, Today, uh, we continue in Luke 14, and we come to actually not one, but we're going to dabble in two parables, because really the text that I just read uh, is two parables. They are separate uh, parables. Uh, At least the last three verses I read lead into another parable, and they set the stage for it. Uh, And the thing, as we have learned, if you'll recall, uh, over and over and over again, every time that we uh, focus on a parable, what we have to do is find uh, ourselves in it. Okay, we have to find who we are in the parable and uh, let our Lord's word uh, touch us. As you can see, our theme today is uh, the blessing of humility. And folks, we're also going to deal with the opposite of humility, pride. Okay, we're going to deal with pride and humility. And uh, what goes on through Scripture all the time is that we receive accurate assessments from God uh, in his word as to where we stand in regards to these things, these subjects. Okay? So expect an accurate assessment uh, of you when it comes to pride and expect an accurate assessment of you when it comes to humility. And the first, I have two scriptures uh, as I begin. Uh, This is accurate assessment number one. And you can find yourself in it. Accurate assessment number one. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Accurate assessment of the day number one. The second accurate assessment uh, comes from our gospel reading in Luke chapter 14, uh, verse 7. Now Jesus told a parable to those who were invited. Now Jesus told a parable to those who were invited. Accurate assessment number two for the day. And that word pride is one we all struggle with. Uh, I know I'm not the only one. Okay, I'd ask for a show of hands, but that might not be something you'd want to be prideful about. <laughs> okay, If I asked you how many of you struggle with pride... I, if I wasn't holding my Bible, both of my hands uh, would go up. And the thing about pride, I, I read a great definition of pride, the sin of pride, by the noted author. I've quoted him many times in my sermons over the years. C.S. Lewis, the noted apologist, defender of the faith, uh, and author of the last century, C.S. Lewis. And this is how he describes pride at its very essence. Okay? Unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Pride is essentially competitive, is competitive by its very nature, while the other vices are competitive only, so to speak, by accident. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. Let me read that one again. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. 
We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good-looking, but they're not. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better-looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good-looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. Only, or once the element of competition has gone, pride is gone. Back to the parable. Jesus noticed how the people picked their seats. And they picked the place of honor. Do you know what the place of honor is? The place of honor is right next to the host. Now, if you think this doesn't apply to our world today, I dare you to summon up the courage at the next wedding to which you're invited is to go sit next to the bride. Just take the seat right there, right there, or right next to the groom. You know what they'd say? No, go to the little card table. You're at table 19, way back in the corner, and go there now. You get the point? When you go to the place of honor, that's another way of saying, if only one person could be invited to this feast, our host would want it to be me. If only one could be here, he'd want me. And that's why I'm taking that seat. Now, when you say that, you're saying a lot about yourself. You're also saying a lot about the other people at the feast, aren't you? How do you think that worked out with the disciples? This is in Mark 10. Verses 35 to 41. And James and John, you remember them, don't you? They were always with Peter in the big three, Peter, James, and John. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to Jesus, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Wow. A little bit of pride? A lot of pride? Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And James and John said to Jesus, we're able, more pride. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my, my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And you think it's over, right? Jesus says, answered their pride. Listen to verse 41. And when the ten heard of it, of the twelve, they began to be indignant at James and John. Peter, Andrew, Thomas, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Judas, all the rest. You see what pride did? Because James and John, wow, if only two are going to be there, for some reason, it would be us, right, Lord? So put us right there. But that's not how it works. That is not how it works. 
And so the ten were indignant, and Jesus had to address all of that. He had to address both the pride of the two and the indignation of the ten. He had to give them an accurate assessment. And so we know the pride, accurate assessment, is very simply. Pride goes before the fall. Isn't that what he said? If you sit in that spot, you're going to be gone. But there's another accurate assessment that I read. I don't know if you caught it as I read it. In this second accurate assessment... Jesus is not saying the parable yet. It's Dr. Luke, the inspired writer, setting the stage for us. Now, Jesus told a parable to those who were invited. It's the perfect participle that gives it away, the accurate assessment. They would be perpetual guests. That's what it means. Ongoing action. If you're invited to the king's wedding feast, if you're invited to faith in the Savior, you are always invited. And you are the perpetual guest. In fact, Even if you're not aware of that, you are a guest in the Creator's world. Luther was very clear about this in his declarations, his definitions, rather, of the articles of the Creed. The first article, gifts of creation. The second article, gifts of salvation. The third article, gifts of sanctification. All of those are given to us. And how did he put it? Come on, you Lutherians, say it with me. Without any merit or worthiness in me. We are perpetual guests. The only way you get into a wedding feast is by being a guest. The only way. And by being invited. And the invitation was secured at the cross. And the empty tomb. The invitation is sealed with the blood of the Savior. The invitation was given to a little baby girl named Charlotte this morning at 8.30 service. Pastor Joe had the privilege of sealing the deal. God went and got this little girl. He did it through water and the Word. She didn't bring anything to the font. Except being darn cute, right? Except being darn cute. But folks, there's no competition. She was invited because a Savior loved her, died for her, rose for her. And so it is with you. We are perpetual guests. There is no competition, as C.S. Lewis said. It's not that one of us sins less than the other, so God loves us more. It's not that one of us has less of a sinful nature. We're all the same. We are all the same. As I think about somehow thinking I could deserve what James and John were looking for, or what the wedding people were looking for, the guests. Folks, the most surprised person of eternity, apart from the great surprises that are coming, okay, because I firmly believe the Scripture teaches wonderful surprises, stuff you'll never guess, and I'll never guess are going to be given to us. The most surprised person in all eternity, if I were given the seat of honor, would be me. There's a whole lot of other people 
who I think should be there. I'm looking at a bunch of them today. My goodness, you put, if it's by works, you put up with me for over 30 years. Wow. But it's not by works, is it? And God's got that all figured out. And it really doesn't matter. But that gets us to the next parable. Did you catch it? Jesus also said to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends. Do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you can be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection. But just because in God's great knowledge and plan, those who are invited to the feast, and our perpetual guests are also invited to invite others. And Jesus addresses who to invite. And one of the great sins that we all struggle with is we always want to go after those people who can repay us or make us look good for whatever reason. And we're back to C.S. Lewis's comparison. Jesus says, when you invite, invite the people who can't repay you. Because we're talking about the kingdom of God not about earthly palaces. And the accurate assessment is pride goes before the fall. And the one who had no pride has invited you. And he's invited me. And he keeps inviting he keeps inviting, he keeps inviting, he keeps... That's why we come here every week, friends. Because I've been told by people when they get honest with me, but pastor, I forget. And something's gone haywire in their life. And I remind them, this does not have anything to do with God's love for you. Because that's what they're thinking. And they look at me and say, but pastor, I forget. Talk about setting the table. Well, come Sunday, we'll remind you. Or better yet, let's talk right now. Let me remind you of the inviter. And we can be content to be perpetual guests. Friends, that's the blessing of humility in the end. The blessing of humility in the end is to know that no matter what, I'm still a guest. You're still a guest. And to say to our God what King David said. Uh, this is the psalm that would have been the psalm for the day if we read the psalm for the day. This is Psalm 131. You remember King David, right? David led a up and down life. I mean, he was the greatest king in Israel and he was an adulterer and he was a murderer and uh, he was the one whom God chose. And but Listen to this one, friends. Oh, Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. We'd say that today. Uh, I don't worry about things past my pay grade. I leave those to you. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. 
I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And at the end of the day, perhaps that's the greatest blessing of humility. We can quiet our souls and be calm about it all, knowing that the one who invites us still does. And we belong to him. Amen. Amen.